Halo, halo. Yes, yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The heroine of uh, next hour is uh, author of five poetry books. I have uh, only three here. One, second, and third. But you have to believe me that uh, uh, she wrote uh, five books. <laughs> that uh, have made, these books have made uh, her own one of the most interesting young writers uh, in Poland. She is a revelation. Like uh, any revelation, her work is also difficult to explain. He, uh, she hesitates between treating language as a piece of matter, a stone in which a poem can be carved, and the very persist, but uh, in fact every day, for our own experience. You know, before you, Natalia Marek. I'd w I would like to read uh, some in your own poems in English uh, for the first of our step in. Sure. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to welcome such a wide audience. Um, it has been a long flight to come to Tivandum and it's going to be a long flight back home. Uh, but it was worth it. It was worth it. Um, so the plan for today is that we're going to read some poems that were translated into English. Um, the poems I'm going to read uh, come from my um, early collections. Uh, you will not be able to hear poems from my two latest collections of poetry, but um, well, let it be a starter for you. I hope you'll grow some appetite for more. Mm, so, um, I know the convention is to sort of introduce the audience to your writing, but I'm not going to do that, or not to the extent that it's been done here. Um, so I'll just read, and if there are any questions, maybe you can ask them afterwards, after the reading, okay? All right. Spoils, which is a title poem from my second collection. Some women advise, before you go, to collect what's scattered. Pajamas, plums, yellow and small like forbidden babies. Slippers, in a pattern that pleases the eye, not gaudy. But don't collect the abandon at the scene of a crush. Don't, let they, don't lay them by. Give them a year to sober up. If a year's too little, you can double it, but not at their request. The results are clear jars that hold both fruit and vinegar. Only fragile left alive. Of course, the title is a play with Jim Jarmusch movie only lovers left alive, but I thought it may correspond well to what the poem is about. Only fragile left alive. Yellowish sheep, guys covered in bristle, guys with it shaved contrary to a recent custom, all inhabitants of the northern states some of the southern ones, none of the forgetful, maybe one of the curious, but I doubt it. No birds that shit lime, and for sure, no women who till now flaunted feathers.
if we eat asparagus, that means pollens thinning out population. There is more of something else, an unexpected rush of long-legged girls. If we eat asparagus, that means from the first, it's May. You can't eat peaches. In the blood, no flow of stress hormones, but probably others. And now maybe um, a few words of explanation. I'm going to read a cycle of poems um, that play with this notion of um, Greek uh, philosophy of Kalos Kegatos, which pretty much says that what is beautiful is good and what is good is beautiful. So there is this relation between beauty and good. And of course, sometimes it's quite misleading to think that when you see something beautiful or someone beautiful, meaning handsome, um, they're going to be good. But it starts with this Carlos Cagatos pathos, and then I'm also going to use a Spanish word, vamos, which is let's go. Pathos. A bird of the Cormoran family with a bold lamp at the gullet, voracious feeder, swims fast. Kalos, a body fragment. There is no body, but in fragments, the doctor traced on my sick note. Can we see? You can, the kids agree. Looking at it, their faces touch their fingers. You prefer to turn around? But that's like balking at paying into the PDA found fund, PA system in the auditorium and the field scattered with clinker. Kids don't want to fuck anything up and they don't have to. Cagatos. Mr. Manchu, okay, maybe a word of explanation here too. Um, Mr. Manchu is a dog, okay? He's a very big dog, a chow chow, uh, which for me um, looks a bit like a bear, in fact. <laughs> Cagatus. Mr. Manchu hits like a bear. 50 years back, the Wrocław Zoo director would have stopped him on the run. Not today. Mr. Manchu belongs where my school ID doesn't work. The red stamp expires in September. In people, life expires on unemployment, often after childbirth, and just sometimes for no cause. Vamos, which is the Spanish word meaning let's go. Somewhere there must be beauty we give in to. Not in Europe, not in Africa, at sea on the wave of someone's trouble, which throws up the same junk as her dear, the older girlfriend's wave of family feelings and wave of biting criticism. That is, money off coupons, damp socks, cracked telephone cases, and delaminated shells. We don't go there to check up on anyone.
Okay, so maybe two more. Um, as, uh, as the first um, set of reading. Um, so all of them actually come from my second collection uh, entitled Spoils. Post-divorce culture. It can be imagined, for example, so, we're eating potatoes and salted butter, long, long holidays in Lorraine last on. Local churches interest me more than local men. Maybe she'd have managed, like before, to keep to some deadlines, adapt them to someone's expectations. Francesca, the tanned girl from a sailing group, recommended getting on the scales each morning. And the last poem from this set has a motto uh, from Richard Hughes, High Wind in Jamaica. I'm going to write the motto first. Writers have often lost their way trying to explain how brilliant a jewel the hummingbird is. It cannot be done. So, green hummingbirds. I can't pretend to be available anymore. You see, when you don't eat meat, it's hard to season poems about little chicks. When you don't do much, but mostly think, about Bianca Balti's heat check, uh, he, sorry, about Bianca Balti's high cheekbones, an austere bit of Bernstein and a strange May hailstorm, you can only, in your white notebook, with a string of green hummingbirds, write out your spells. They did not leave me, and so, they didn't reach you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes. You are walking a path that poetic maps do not see, I think so, between materialism and confession, between uh, objectivism and uh, linguistics, between aphorism and the avant-garde. First question, where are you coming from? Who are you from? That's a very complicated question. And I just want to make sure that we're all, or maybe I'll just make a disclaimer first, okay? Um, as much as I like participating in this kind of events, festivals, poetry readings, discussion series, whatever, I don't believe in anything solid that can be said from my side. In other words, whatever I say about my poem, or my work, or my ambitions, ambitions, or my whatever, is just a declaration, is just my intent. And I would not like to be taken too seriously, or I call it didactic maybe. So there is no lesson I, I am here to deliver. There is no knowledge I'm here to pass. So whatever I say is just, the way I feel today, and it may change tomorrow, and it may change in a year. Um, I already feel like a different person from the time when I was writing The Spoils. It was 214, the year that it was published. I was writing it a year or two before, so it's already 10 years. So that feels, you know, whatever was true about my, my intention 10 years ago, is not true about my intention or my readings or my interests today. So just just to make sure there is this disclaimer. Um, but um, I'm, I was very happy when you uh, when you wrote me um, that this is the way you see my work because this is well this is the way I would like to see my work seen, you know. So um, I would like to see my work to go across the borders, the boundaries of all these concepts that are there in poetry, 
So I'm not a huge fan of confessional poetry. Um, I don't really see myself as a confessional poet, but sometimes I employ confessional style, methods, confessional moments, because it works. So same story with objectivist. I, you know, um, two books ago and well, how many years, six years ago, I would definitely identify myself with objectivism, with the objectivist style, documentation. Um, but now I'm not sure anymore. I'm not sure anymore. Now my interests somehow floated, drifted away towards life sciences, towards the language itself, the, the, the way you can experiment with your language, the way you can, for example, form words. So I'm a huge fan of word formation and false etymologies, for example. It's not something you can easily translate into English or any other language because it's somehow embedded in your own language. So, you know, when you have a word, um, any word, and you just invent your own thing out of this word and you do it according to some rules, grammatical rules. But this word, this very word, did not exist before. It's correct. It can be adapted into the corpus of the language, into the body of the language, but it's actually both yours, some kind of an idiolect, and others. It belongs it, it somehow starts belonging to the language itself, to all the people speaking the language. So this is something that fascinates me today, um, to experiment with this kind of thing, with word formation, with false etymologies, with um, word blending. Um, I hope I will not turn into Joyce someday. <laughs> that would be not um, the direction I want to go to. Um, I, I mean, I stick to one language. I don't, I don't believe into mixing mm -hmm. too many languages in just one poem. So I stick to, to Polish and I experiment with Polish. Uh, but I also like stories. So sometimes I tell stories in my poems, like a story of someone I met, a story of a lorry driver, a story of a person I overheard at a gallery, at an art gallery, talking about their careers or whatever, or about some everyday life stuff. Uh, sometimes I tell the story of two women sitting at the back of a bus and having a conversation, you know, about their families or about what they're going to bring to the graveyard they're going to. So these are the sources uh, of my poetry. I could, I could say pretty much anything can work. I mean, I feed on everything. I'm a voracious feeder, like in the poem. <laughs> so I'm a voracious feeder. Um, and then when it comes to some traditions, because I guess um, you also wanted to know the traditions, the literary traditions or the world, um, traditions. Um, I studied American Lit and English Lit, so this is my, this is my field, right? I, I feel at home uh, when reading um, American literature, American poetry, my primary source of, well, I would not call it inspiration maybe, but my primary source of all was um, Emily Dickinson, Ezra Pound, um, yeah, these two names, oh, Charles Resnikov, Elizabeth Bo uh, Bishop to an extent, Jane Bowles, when you think about short stories. I also like short stories, so Jane Bowles is my recommendation, Carson McCullers, Flannery O'Connor, um, yeah, I would recommend uh, them all. Uh, I see. Uh, Derek Sosnitsky, mm, Told that uh, poetry is not ideology. Uh, 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 one uh, one hour ago, what do you think about it? 
I agree with it, but I think my take is a bit different from Derek's one. So he said that poetry is this autonomous ground, um, free from any ideology. I think poetry is an autonomous ground, but this is a ground that is constantly being invaded by different ideologies. And sometimes you want to de deconstruct them, sometimes you want to rebel against them, but sometimes you think you want to make fun of them or you want to employ them into a poem to, you know, somehow so to, to make them work for you. So to, to change the purpose that a um, given ideology was, um, you know, um, invented for or made for. So an ideology, and, and I, I'm aware this is an ideology, like with all the principles and certain structure of thought that is part of ideology. So I'm I'm pretty aware of the fact that feminism can be seen as ideological thing, but at the same time I'm a huge supporter of uh, women's liberation and um, you know women's right, right, uh, and even though I don't address the question directly, I I never address the question directly, I want to support this cause, which I believe in. So maybe I'm supporting it in a different way, in a non-direct way, um, by just making my protagonists female. And this is already an act of, it's already a choice, an ideological choice or a political choice that most my characters, if you can talk about characters in poems, are actually women. I tell the stories of them. The, well, A, um, it's interesting for me. B, I have some first-hand knowledge, <laughs> some first-hand experience that uh, I may relate to. And C, I see it also as a kind of a cause that, or a way I can submit to this general feminist movement. Uh, this is not to say I never write about men. Sometimes I try to imagine myself as a man. Oh, yes, do you feel a member of feminist in the poetry, feminist literature in Poland? No? Sorry, sorry? Do you feel a, fem a member of feminist movement uh, in literature, of mm. course, in Poland? No? Mm. That's again a difficult question because the thing is, um, uh, you called me a revolution, right? At the very beginning or something. Um, so a funny story is that my right revelation. revelation. Okay, no, not a not revolution, a revelation. Okay, fine. Uh, but maybe these two can combine somehow. Um, the thing is that my writing was first recognized by men, not by the feminist scholars, but by male scholars. I was, and I was trying to think about it. Why? Why would not? Why no feminist scholar? Why it wasn't the f a feminist scholar who wrote about my text as the first person ever to write a review of my text? And the answer is maybe because there is some stereotypical way of seeing what is feminist and what is non-feminist. So the stereotypical thing is that if you're a woman, that's not enough anymore you need to write about body, you need to write about physiology, you need to write about children. I don't have children, so it's very difficult for me to, you know, write about them. I, I, I would need some other people's children to interact with, to be able to, you know, get the way children think or get the way children speak. And I know that children fuel a lot of poetry with their, you know, language, with their family's e um, ideolect, etc. So, um, so yeah, so I sort of feel part of the feminism and the feminist movement, but not necessarily of the feminist literary scholarship anymore, yeah. if you know what I mean. 
uh, especially in the academia, there is this division between scholarship and movement. That's also been theorized in feminism as such. I studied the theory. Uh, so I'm on this movement side rather than on the scholarship side. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think it's time for the second set of your poetry, but yeah, uh, uh, I have a one question. Do you believe in translating poetry? <laughs> Impossibility <laughs> to translate poetry uh, enough good? Mm. Again, there is, there is pro and there is con. Um, I believe some poetry is translatable without much damage. Um, so there are poems that can be translated and not much is lost there in translation. But there are also a huge, there is also a huge body of poetry that is so difficult to translate, but um, not because the topic is, d is difficult or because the writer or the poet is, you know, making it difficult on purpose, mm, rather because it's embedded in this linguistic search linguistic experimentation and when it comes to the word formation for example the rules are language specific right you you can experiment with another language rules but that means an adaptation not a translation and it happened to me i uh it happened to me actually that together with my french translator we adapted my poems, uh, which are written in a very reduced syntax in Polish. So my syntax is like the shortest possible. Sometimes I skip the verb, sometimes I skip the pronoun. Um, that's um, unacceptable in French, in good French. They have their own syntactic rules and the syntax in French is a sacred thing you know you 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 don't make those bad sentences that means you're badly educated or something um, so we adapted my poems into French I was trying to convince my translator to um, you know use all the mistakes or lapses she can think of she was also a teacher. I mean, she is a teacher. She teaches at, um, I guess, some mid-school. So it was relatively easy for her to think about a mistake. Uh, I don't know if an Algerian French can make when learning French. Yeah. And we were adopting this kind of thinking to, to make it work. I don't know, I don't speak French, so I cannot judge if the translations are good or not. Those of you who speak French may have a look. Um, but this is what we do, we work together and it was constant dialogue. So it was adaptation more than a translation. And also, of course, translators um, are different. And um, I believe a good translator is not a solitary person. Most people in this profession are, are usually solitary, they stick to their own company. They like working on their own. So, but I believe in poetry, this attitude does not work. You, you need to keep talking to your author. And that's why it's so difficult to translate those who are already dead. Um, you need to keep talking to your, to your writer, to your poet, uh, and consult the concept, because sometimes the concept is similar but the linguistic expression must differ, you know? It had to be, for example, uh, the, the concept of a mistake, fine, but there is a different way of making mistakes in Polish, and there is a different way of making mistakes in French, or in English for that matter, or in German, so. Or in Spanish. Uh, so, it's a good, uh, good moment, good reason. Uh, you read some, uh, uh, some poems in English, and this surprise, Spanish. Uh, yes, I wanted to um, 
read, let's say, two poems in Spanish, because I also speak Spanish, so, so that you know, if there are any Spanish speakers, they can relate to that. Uh, but I will continue with uh, my English translations and then um, move on to the Spanish ones. Okay, so now um, poems from my third collection that was entitled Chord. The Seed. The Seed of Minimalism sprouted in Matilda. She took a walk. Important matters occupied her, no less than trivial ones. The pool, the Baltics, population and depopulation, like hair pieces. So many actions are linked to coffee imports, and yet it's indispensable. She watched the street, the seed in Matilda, a hill of beans. The Address Ladies and gentlemen, I invite some of you to the Bellini concert, the others to the community gardens, or south. Does it fit in with your plans for sailing off? If not, I'll try something different. We put sideburns on the knight's face and face masks on our own. And we wait. Music is a kind of plea. Pleats and tax. And it's like an example of what I was talking about. So, pleats and tax is an English word um, for some type of um, material ornament you can have on a women's dress. And um, in Polish, I used an, a word in an incorrect context. So the, a Polish title of this poem is, is bad Polish, pretty much. But in English, this is normative. OK, please and tax. I explained to the boy, the country with B can't be Brussels. I change nothing in the world, Joanna put it melodramatically before Easter, and then that rivers don't work as well as shoelaces, although they bind people tighter than birthday parties. You don't like the lacy style of writing women, but I discovered recently, for big occasions, I pick pleats and tucks. And now the title poem from this collection, Chord. And maybe a word of explanation. This poem was written when I was, um, when I was living, in fact, or visiting the US, Chicago, um, and traveling a bit to Chord. They studied fiber, both Tulsi with her shaved hat, beautiful skull, and the Arab girl, that's her nickname, who could be pleased about just anything. And P, not long ago, John Cale wanted him to leave his wife. And he nearly clapped his hands and the muscles in his thighs tightened. But joy faded when he sang in the silver bowl of Chicago. There, at every turn, the barnacle geese, larvae, unnecessary bushels. And by the way, you can study fiber in the Chicago Art Institute. There is a fiber department.
What to do when the liberal left falls silent? Stand with your feet, hips apart. Bend gently. Straighten your arms out in front. Make them a bale of cloth, a brighter top to the breakwater. Repeat. I am free as a pit viper. I am fearsome as the daughter of a pit viper. No one desires me yet this way. Thank you. That was the English reading. Unfortunately, that's all I have, so I cannot read you from my more recent collections. But now to Spanish speakers, uh, maybe two poems in Spanish, okay? La novela y luego la película. No entender nada del amor de los niños de 12 años y no llamarlo así, pero escuchar sus canciones, míralos recopiando cortas estrofas y tocar los objetos que para ellos son su testimonio. No se parecen a las guindas europeas. No saber nada sobre la fruta ni mirarla con asombro, sino seguir el destino de los niños de 12 años, como si sus cabezas fueron las de pato en un marinado, las mayores delicias. El futuro. Una mujer delgada, hallando de alguien por el carril derecho. Detrás de ella, un rastro de grasa, ecos de insin insinuaciones. ¿De dónde sacar los ojos para que nos acompañen? Gracias. Thank you, but I am sure that people want to listen to your Polish, one Polish uh, <laughs> poem, okay? <laughs> Finally, for instance. Yeah, this. I think I will just read, um, I will, uh, because these two, these two collections are the ones that got translated into English in many other languages. So now, um, for you to experience the sound of um, our language, I'm going to read from my very recent collection that was that came out, I think, in December, last December, right before Christmas. So it's going to be one of my first readings, actually. Plandeka i przeźrocza. Jeden. Poruszenie. Ale czego? Tematu? Plandeki na wozie. I naraz głosy w plikach awi, trochę ścięte. Gdyby ktoś mnie widział w tym tureckim wychodku, kuczną, zapatrzoną w ciebie, jak próbuje się z tym kryć. I naraz... Kłódka na abisynce, taras pod skosem, osa między palcami u stóp. Dwa. Jakby wciąż przesuwano dekoracje, oko próbowało znaleźć wysięgnik, podnośnik, ale to przed nim, tajemnice. Trzy. Może byłam kuczna, kurczowa, skryta w jednym lub drugim terminalu, Niby dla oszczędności. Zaoszczędziłam, 
będę wydawać. Dziękuję bardzo.